So let's get rolling this morning. We are a small group, but I know that we are a mighty group. So excited to excited and thankful to have you guys here on this Wednesday at the end of July as we are just watching our days tick by till the end of summer and the school year starts, but it's all good things. So this morning, we're going to talk about creating that classroom environment for wellness. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how do we do that, um, not just for our kids to feel safe and supported and welcome and belonging in our classrooms, but also for our adults and our educators to create that space where they also feel um, regulated, safe, accepted, belonging, all of those things. Um, so let's jump into introductions. Um, if you are, I, there's a couple new names here, um, but not all. So we're going to do some introductions. So I'm Emily Arkfeld, um, Social Emotional Behavioral Learning Specialist in Nebraska MTSS. And I am finalizing my transition from serving Region 5 to Region 2. Um, Sarah is joining us from Region 5, but she doesn't officially start until August. So I'm helping to support in these last couple weeks here. And then we'll be full-time Region 2, ESUs 2, 3, and OPS. I'm so excited about that. And I will let Jill go and we're, we will work our way down. Sounds great. Thanks, Emily. Jill Gunther, Social Emotional Behavioral Learning Specialist for Region 3. Um, previously was serving Region 3 and 4, but with some new additions, uh, now moving to just Region 3. So ESU is 1, 7, and 8. Uh, and then for those of you that might be new to our Coffee Connects, like Emily said, my background is speech language pathology and then special education leadership. Thank you. And I said start at the top. You are the top of my screen, but you are not the top of our region. So sorry about that, Mackenzie. <laughs> That's OK. Uh, I'm Mackenzie Rydell. I'm Social Emotional Behavior Learning Specialist for Region 1, which is ESU 4, 5, and 6, and LPS. Um, I previously also served Region 2, but Emily has transitioned. And um, I was a school psychologist before this job, and I'm just going to sit back and listen today. So I'm excited for this morning. Thanks, Mackenzie. And we are very excited to officially welcome um, Chandra to Region 4. So I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell a little bit about herself as well. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chandra Essex, and I am the new SEBL for Region 4, which is ESUs 9, 10, 11, and 17. Um, I'm super excited to be a part of our team. Uh, this last year, I was in New York shoes and setting in the Coffee Connects and learning from this group. So I'm excited to still learn and help them um, deliver this important information. So my background is higher education. I've done some social services work for communities and then um, most recently finished a degree in school counseling and worked um, for in a district, local district doing their AWARE grant. So that is me and I'm excited to meet everyone. Thank you. All right. So we're gonna start with our welcoming inclusion activity as we always do for our trainings, our workshops, meetings, um, just to get one, a feel for the room, feel what, what everyone is coming in with. Um, maybe it's just to get a quick check-in of knowledge and experience before we start. So we always like to do these for ourselves, but also to give you just um, some to put in your toolbox as you go into meetings and trainings and workshops and things. So we are going to do this one on Menti. So if you go to menti.com or um, use a QR code, you'll put in the code 37548639. And when Jill switches over to Menti, it will also show that code. Um, and so we just want to know in a couple get that in a word or a couple of words or a phrase um, what wellness means to you. So if you take a second, menti.com um, or use a QR code if you want to do it on your phone, it's quick and easy. Um, and we'll take a second for that to fill in. Thank you. I see them starting to come in here in our small but mighty group again. Adjusted, health, happy, self care. Jill. 
trying to count how many we have on the screen and then make a guessment. Perfect call. Thank you. Great. Balance, calm, comfort, energized, I like included. These are great. Okay. If you have not completed it, feel, please feel free to. We like to go back and add, sometimes we'll add them to the, um, the slide deck before we post that online. So thank you for participating in that. And really it's, it is that view that like wellness means different things to everyone and that's okay. And wellness is a continuum um, and that is okay also. So it doesn't matter where you're falling on that wellness continuum, um, putting things into place of what self-care, wellness, well-being means to you um, to help you along with that. Okay, so our Padlet, um, as always, <laughs> We want to share this, remind you that we have this. We put all of our links and then some in this Padlet for you guys to go back and find resources. If you need to, you can share the Padlet. This is not just for people who participate in our Coffee Connects. We want to share this um, organization-wide, statewide. If you know people in other states who are getting started and struggling, please feel free to share that with them as well. We are going to, so on this Padlet, we're going to put this Summer Coffee Connect and then we will start a new Padlet for our Fall Coffee Connects, which will still link to this Padlet with all of that. We just, we want to make sure it doesn't get too overwhelming when you open it up and you know where to go for your resources and things. And so we're trying to keep it as organized as possible. So we'll start a new clean one for the fall, um, but you'll always have access to this one through that as well. Um, and just a reminder, our password is capital MTSS to get into that. Okay, so our definition, social emotional behavioral learning, um, for those of us, it looks like, again, most of you have been with us before, but it's always a good reminder. It's a systematic process of fostering social emotional skills among our students and adults. We, have, we know we have to focus on our adults to help reach our students um, in order to create those safe and supportive environments with positive behavioral and mental health outcomes at all. Again, adding mental health in this last year to show that connection, um, social emotional learning, behavior, mental health, all of it is rolled, it was really rolled into one and each influences um, the other. And you can't take out one and focus on one without also touching or addressing other places. And so um, we had the flower on here for a while to show that social emotional behavioral learning was really the roots um, of that learning and growth um, and all of that. And so we have taken that out because we kind of forgot to talk about it sometimes and so put the castle wheel back in here which is what we have um, really built a lot of our focus off of so the um, collaborative for academic and social emotional learning um, has this wheel which has the five competencies which we do use a self-awareness self-management responsible decision making relationship skills and social skills um, and again adding in that piece that it is it is that ripple effect. It happens in all of these areas. So we are focusing on this in our classrooms. We are focusing on it in our schools. Um, how do we engage our families and caregivers in that and our bigger community? And when we work on it, even just small, on a smaller scale in our classroom, um, it does ripple out into those other environments as well. And when our students learn and foster and model and when our educators and our staff do as well, um, then they take that out into their families and their caregivers and their community as well. So really it is, um, it has a larger effect of just what we're doing in our classrooms every day. Because we know that we need those competencies, like I said, um, in order to have those positive um, values, expectations, norms that we want in our classrooms and in our schools. Um, for our own mental well-being and wellness like we're talking about today, and then to be college and career and community ready. So again, when we focus on these skills that are a part of these competencies, um, it helps us be successful in all of these areas. We have our wheel as that reminder that we talk about these competencies as this large overarching construct and we want to focus in these areas, but what does that actually mean? And so this dives down into those skills that fall into these areas and some of them do overlap into other areas. Um, but again, to help to help our educators, to help our students, to help our families and community who maybe aren't as entrenched in it as our educators are every day, just to show that these are things that are already being done in our classrooms, in our schools every day. This is not, we're not adding something else. We are not trying to get our students to do additional things, but really we are focusing on teamwork and responsible decision-making 
and um, setting goals and achieving those goals and knowing who we are and who do we want to be and how do we fit into our community and what do we have to offer them um, with empathy and understanding other perspectives within our school community and our larger community as well. Um, so diving into now really our focus for today is this, how do we build that classroom environment, that school environment for well-being, um, that climate and culture, that positive learning environment. And in, I would say, majority of the research in building this presentation, this training, this Coffee Connect for you guys today, it really comes down to the same things. Everyone is saying the same things. And it's nothing new that we haven't talked about or you guys haven't come across before, but um, looking at maybe a little bit broader and a, more of a system focus and how do we build that? And then just those good reminders of like, oh yes, this is good practice. And what I'm doing is achieving the things that I'm hoping it will achieve. And so we want to build those relationships. We need to get to know our students and we need to let them know you as, as humans also and have that back and forth relationship. Um, we need to be addressing individual needs through database decision making always. Um, give students choice and a voice and a choice. This is their learning. This is their life. And so what we're doing in place has to be working for them. And we won't know that unless we're talking to them and getting their feedback on things. Being consistent, offering that consistent, structured environment and routine we know is best for everybody. Um, Summer, I don't know for you guys, but summer for myself and my children without our structure and routine has been really hard. And so when kids come to school and they know what to expect and it's consistent, um, most of them thrive in that environment. Having those clear and positive rules, again, goes back to that consistency and that structure. Um, having a room where they feel it's not overwhelming, it is warm, they want to be there, they're seeing their work and their art represented on the walls and feel that they belong in this space. Um, getting everyone engaged and challenged. So again, addressing those inv individual needs, knowing what each student needs to engage in the learning and engage in the work and feel challenged by what they're doing to keep that engagement high. Um, we are building that community of learners and we are ce ce celebrating success and failure. Failure is not a bad thing. It's how we learn and grow and build upon the knowledge that we already have. Um, so this is just a nice visual representation of all of those things that, again, we are doing, our educators are doing every day, um, but just those good reminders of how um, the importance of these. So diving into that a little bit more, um, we have, this is from this Environments Filled with Safety and Belonging, which is um, a wealth of information about how to do this, gives some specifics, and then breaks that down into what that might actually look like. And so we liked this in showing that, um, where we want, maybe where we are and where we want to go. And so thinking about those discipline practices when they vary from class to class and different expectations for relationships, again, that is that takes away from that consistency, that structure, that um, sense of belonging and knowing whatever teacher I go to or when I move up in levels, this should look similar. Um, so moving towards those shared norms and values, um, and maybe that's through something like PBIS that you're putting into your school-wide or your classroom to help your educators know the language, the values that they're putting in place. And then the students know that as well. It doesn't matter where they go. Um, it looks the same and the language is the same. The expectations, the values are the same. Um, the We know that no, no school is focused on academic only. We keep putting more things and we're asking educators, please take, please help with this and take on this and do this for our students. And so we know that's really probably not happening anywhere, but how we do that is building that community um, through social and academic work. They are interconnected again. And so when we put the focus on all that whole child piece, um, we see the best success for everyone. Um, and we build those heterogeneous classrooms through our community norms um, and common expectations where everyone has a place in our classrooms. We are inclusive classrooms for all and we're not separating out um, by race, class, language, disability. Um, our, our communities, our classroom communities and school communities are built on shared responsibility. That is, so sh we have that as one of our Nebraska MTSS essential elements that shared leadership and infrastructure where everyone has a voice. And again, that includes our students and our families as well. 
Um, and then we want to move away from that exclusionary discipline and really look at um, those restorative practices that build the relationships, build upon our relationships, um, resolve conflict, and um, really connect the students to their community in the school and outside of the school also. So this is similar to the link on the previous page, um, but has some different information. So we really um, organized the presentation today by the recommendations that came from this Learning Policy Institute. And it goes through a lot of the science of learning, um, brain development, what our students and what adults need to be engaged and active learners. And then it gives some recommendations for how to do that in a way that supports the whole child within your classroom and your school. Um, and so the first recommendation talks about um, including measures of school climate, social emotional support, school exclusions, and your accountability and improvement systems, which um, we talk a lot about in our continuous improvement process, um, our SIP plans and things like that, is making sure we have all of this data. And so, um, we also want to adopt standards or other guidance for social, emotional, and cognitive learning. And we in Nebraska, we've talked about this, we don't have specific SEL or SEBL standards, but we do know that they are really are embedded, the competencies are embedded in our academic standards. And so we've shown before the connection between the two, but really being able to identify and pull out those pieces and then intentionally work on teaching those within our academic lessons um, and not just standalone social, emotional learning lessons. Replace zero tolerance policies um, regarding school discipline with discipline, discipline policies focus on explicit learning of those social emotional strategies and restorative practice, which we'll talk a little about a little bit about. Um, incorporating our educator competencies into licensing and accreditation. And again, that's like outside of our scope of what we're talking about, but was included in the recommendation. And then funding um, for school climate surveys, social emotional learning, restorative practice which we are really grateful for our partnership with NDE that helps us have those conversations and know what funding is available, how can they access that? And so then we can trickle that down into our conversations as well. Um, so looking first at those school climate pieces and using that data in um, our school improvement process, we have some resources here about how, how do we get this information? How do we put this out there? And so there's the Panorama self -serve, or staff survey which looks at all the competencies, um, beliefs about our teaching, beliefs about our students, a self-care self -care quiz, a professional life, quality of life measure, and then this organizational health inventory. So getting that um, elementary or middle school version of how do they feel um, the organizational health is. And so you can share these things with your educators to get kind of a snapshot of how do they feel things are working in their building, um, how their own self-care is, and maybe where they need to build some pieces in for themselves. So wanted to give you some of those resources. We've given lots in the past, um, so we're trying to like add in some different things so that if you keep coming back to us, um, it's not all just, it, there is some new information. And then moving into the next piece, looking at um, kind of that system-wide thing. So this is an example from an educator wellness toolkit, and I'm going to have Jill open it in a minute because it is so much more than just what this snapshot is. Um, there are all kinds of resources, systems-focused, um, competency-focused, those dimensions of wellness, and it gives some examples at the bottom. So if you have time, um, I encourage you to just kind of flip through that, if you will. It goes through, again, some of the background stuff, why we need to care about this, um, which I, if you're here, you obviously do care about it and are looking for some things. So please feel free to flip through that. And we're going to talk about, yeah, that piece in a sec. Okay. So what do you think about system... <laughs> Pause. <laughs> okay. So thinking about it like systematically, when we think about policies, we want to have policies in place. Um, and so that support the wellness of our educators, um, thinking in educator realm here, um, but also trickles to our students. 
So a policy might look like having a policy that allows staff to help to purchase healthy meals in the cafeteria at a discount. Um, I think we also, when I worked in schools, anyone who was doing lunch duty got lunch that day for free or things like that. So how do we how do we build this into um, making sure our staff have access to things or if we're taking up their lunch period, making sure that they have time um, to eat something that is a healthy meal and not just a quick grab and go. Your practice uh, might look like allowing time for staff and students to take physical activity breaks or participate in social activities that promote positive relationships among staff. Um, when you're thinking about building your norms, so your shared norms, um, perhaps that would be leadership participation and wellness offerings to set the tone and encourage people to participate. Um, Cause it, not everyone is super excited about participating in self-care activities or wellness acti activities. And so if your administrators are showing up, they're giving a hundred percent and showing like, this is a, this is something we value. This is something we feel important. And here we are <laughs> being vulnerable and putting ourselves out there to participate. It helps give our um, staff and educators permission to also participate in that. And then maybe you're building in your infrastructure as quiet space for mindfulness, deep breathing, or stress relief approaches. And I think a lot of schools, even if it's just individual classrooms, um, have really built into those calming corners. We have a, an image of that later, um, or a uh, calming room, or a self-care room, or something, a, per, a space that is just um, specifically for people to come and take a few minutes to um, use some self-care strategies, some fidgeting, some coloring, some deep breathing. They might have, you know, salt lamps or things like that just to address lots of different variety of ways people might need to just have a minute. So that's included in the educator wellness toolkit, but just thinking about that big picture of like from policy um, to infrastructure as well. So talking more about restorative practices. Um, so we wanted to include this in here because restorative practices really enable educators and school leaders to understand how they might unintentionally escalate or trigger a problem. Um, and then how do we resolve some conflict from that and create those healthier, more positive interactions. But really they are processes that proactively build healthy relationships and a sense of community to prevent and address conflict and wrongdoing. So these are kind of the tenets of that. Um, it helps if when you're putting restorative practices in the way that restorative practices is intended to be done, it helps build those healthy relationships. It reduces, prevents harmful behavior. It can repair harm and restore positive relationships, resolve conflict and hold individuals and groups accountable um, and address the needs of the school and the, or the school community through um, data and things like that. And so really liked this next slide that shows a continuum of what restorative practices is. When I first started in schools, um, we had a, there was a situation with a student and my supervisor gave me like a list of restorative practice questions and was like, here, do a restorative practice like um, a conference with a student. And I was like, I what? I don't even know what this is. What are you throwing at me? And so when it, when done correctly, when really building it in, it's so much more than that. Um, and so this is a nice continuum that it's not just when you're addressing problem behavior, but it really can be preventative too. So in recognizing the identity and what students are bringing and what staff are bringing into the classroom and into the school environment every day, what they're coming with, what's in their backpacks, um, not just like book backpacks. Um, and then it's helping build those classroom practices and building community through circle time, um, intentional relationship building. It's adding and then adding into the curriculum onto those things that you have already built, that foundation you have built. And then it can move into that responsive. So having um, conversations for minor incidents, having restorative groups or circles, and then the formal conference for those serious incidents and issues. So uh, just a nice continuum to show how it works from the preventative through the responsive. And also when you think about, so if you have built in expectations or values like these into your school or into your classroom, so this one is built off of being safe, be engaged and be respectful. How can you add in the self-care piece of that? Um, we've talked a lot in recent years about building social emotional learning into your um, 
expectations and values also, but this takes it a step further and really looking at the self-care. So in being safe, perhaps that means you have an emotional support team, you are double checking on friends. So if your friend says, I'm fine, but you don't think so, maybe it's circling back to being like, okay, but like what's really going on and not just taking that at face value. Um, utilizing EAP resources or for students, um, knowing who they can go to in their building, whether that is checking with the counselor, the school site, the school social worker, um, their like their person, if that's if it's just a staff person, that is not just a staff person, but if it is a staff person, a teacher, a para, um, the cafeteria, the secretary, whoever that might be, knowing the process to ask for help when they're um, feeling that sense of hopelessness or just that they're not 100%. Um, being engaged. So this goes back to that self-awareness, um, aware of your stress level, recognizing and naming your emotions, recognizing and paying attention to joy. I think that's hard. We talk about that, but do we really recognize the moments um, of joy in our life and focus on those? It goes back to that gratitude piece as well, being like, gosh, this really, I really enjoyed this. This makes me happy. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Um, recognizing and validating grief. So often we like to push things away. We don't, as educators, we don't have time to deal with this right now, but being able just to sit with some things for a while and be like, this is hard and this sucks. Um, and then using some of our self-management strategies to work through that. Doing a body check for areas of tightness or discomfort and taking movement breaks and hydrating. Um, and I will always say, and especially in this section and throughout what we're talking about today, what is good for us as educators and adults is good for our students and what we're putting in place for our students is good for us as well. And so if we need a movement break, um, if we need to go get a drink of water. If we need to do something, we need to watch puppies um, for two minutes, like our students are gonna benefit from that as well. And so if you start to feel dysregulated, it's fine again to acknowledge that and be like, gosh, I am really, I'm feeling a little stressed or it's been a busy morning or gosh, we've got testing and it's a little bit overwhelming. So let's take a couple minutes and try these different strategies. And again, good for us, good for them and vice versa. Um, and then being respectful in this, nurturing your body with healthy food, calming routines for sleep and, and building in a routine for daily exercise. And that doesn't mean doing an hour long CrossFit workout if that's not your thing, but if that is going for a walk in the morning, over your lunch period, after school, taking your dog for a walk with a partner, with your kids, um, going swimming, anything like that to move your body and get your blood flowing and pumping um, is always a positive. Okay, so moving into recommendation two, um, we think about how we design our schools. Um, we really, we talk so much about relationships and all of the research shows relationships and anything shows relationships are truly the foundation for um, schools, academic success, for well-being, for ourselves, for our students, for everyone involved. Um, so we really want to focus on building those strong personalized relationships. We want to build those safe, culturally responsive classroom environments where, again, every student sees themselves within that classroom and every staff sees themselves in the, within their building and they feel belong and they connect in. I'm gonna integrate student supports um, using that multi-tiered system of support, again, to focus on identifying specific needs, putting things in place that are um, specific for that student and using that whole child wraparound services involving the community where we can. Um, so it's not just we get a student who gets identified as needing tier three supports maybe in mental health and we push them out to a community referral and we cross them off our list and we say we're done with them. But how do we build that as a partnership um, where we are really wrapping around the student, um, working with a therapist, having conversations about how do we best support the student um, in the school environment, um, using universal design for learning. And so I focusing on or being, proactive and really thinking about like, gosh, what, what are the needs of my students and how do I build an environment within my classroom that is accessible for all students? And so it's not like, well, okay, I have to do this for this kid and this for this kid and this for this kid. And that gets a little overwhelming of trying to always identify what do I need to put in place? What am I missing? Who's falling through the cracks? But just how do we design our classroom um, where students can have a choice 
and a voice and saying, this works best for me and I'm gonna choose this and I'm gonna advocate for myself for this. Um, using extended learning time, again, on focused on those needs and then always including that outreach to families. Our families know our students. They like We as educators spend a lot of time with kids but these families are in these students' lives for their life. And so making sure that they are a part of the conversation, they are a part of what we're putting into place. Um, and we are taking their experiences, their knowledge into account as we are building this safe environment for our students. Um, and so some ways to focus on those relationships. Um, we have some resources here, the 36 questions to increase connectedness connectedness at school. So just conversation. I think most educators are pretty good talkers. I don't think you can without being, but if you need some help with just some questions to prompt that um, back and forth relationship building, especially with kiddos who maybe are a little bit harder to connect with or to engage in conversation, here are some questions to help just prompt that. And then we link the student interest survey here as well. Um, knowing your kids' interests. And then not only does that help you have conversations with them, but if there are ways you can build that into the academic and tie those things together for them as well. So if you've got a lot of kids who are really into, I'm just going to throw out trains, <laughs> um, how can you build trains into what you are teaching them academically to keep them engaged? Maybe they've got some things that they can teach the class that they know about trains that connects to what you're learning that day. So um, getting to know your students in a variety of ways. Um, also, so student to student as well. This isn't just staff and teacher and educator to student, but how do we help make those connections with our students also? Um, so on this next slide, we have this Me Too, That's Me game, which is linked in the title there. Um, a game to find common interests among peers or adults, to, again, to help build that welcoming um, classroom community. Um, we have some additional that's me questions, some icebreaker questions. So again, just a bunch of resources to be able to pull up like beginning of year or you've got some changes within your classroom or you're noticing some like clicking, like let's pull out some of these things to um, re-engage our students in that conversation and getting to know interests of like, oh, I might not have talked to this peer otherwise, but I just found out that they also do Taekwondo. And that's something that I that I do all the time. So maybe now we have the shared interests that we could communicate about. Another resource is the Learning Buddies, um, where students check in with each other during the day to see if their buddy needs help in a variety of ways. So whether that is completing an assignment, um, getting their desk organized, maybe it's help choosing a book in the library or solving a conflict. Um, so these can be simple things, again, like hey, I see you got a couple questions left in this assignment. Do you need some help completing that? All the way to like, hey, I'm having this issue with my peer or my sibling or my parent. Can like, like let's, can we talk about this? Um, you can also connect staff buddies in that. So that um, mentoring piece of things also um, and links from the teaching with the heart in mind. So there's some other resources as well for that. And then, going back to that culturally responsive, culturally inclusive, um, we want to build that environment where all students are valued, respected, and empowered. Um, so this comes from the book, The First Days of School, How to Be an Effective Teacher. It also comes from our um, regional leads put together their crash course um, for tip strategy. So this was active student engagement. Um, but that conversation that like, for all students that in this space, we value embrace each other's difference, differences, perspectives, and points of views. It goes back to that social awareness that we plan learning, um, validate students' lived realities, cultural identities, and heritage, which again, we learn from our engagement and involvement of their families, from our student interest surveys, from just talking to our students and getting to know them, and supporting and partnering with families and a wide representation of community agencies. So again, so that each student comes in and feels that they have access to a space where they are belong, like they feel that they belong, that they are connected, that they are worthy, that they are respected for whatever they are bringing into the classroom. Okay, we hand it off. Perfect, thanks Emily. 
Um, so yes, continuing to move um, within that recommendation too. So we wanted just to provide some examples when we're thinking about creating that safe, culturally responsive classroom, um, creating that sense of community. So both for staff and for students. So you've probably noticed as we've kind of gone through and given some of these resources, um, we really wanted to focus on providing those resources, providing some of those different links really around creating that classroom environment for both students and staff. Um, so you see here just a few different um, pictures when we're thinking about really creating that classroom community and some different ways to set that up. Um, you know, thinking about different various seating options, thinking about, you know, some for the elementary classrooms, maybe some kid sized chairs, maybe some wiggle stools, things like that. Um, ball chairs, obviously, uh, very important as well. Uh, working together to really create those classroom norms. So really co-creating those classroom norms. And we put a link on there for that as well that just kind of walks you through um, kind of how that could be done. Um, we have brain breaks linked on there. And then we also have one on the next slide too, talking a little bit about that. We have a link for a virtual calming room, um, which again has a variety of different links within there. Thinking about, um, you know, watching like pet cams or listening to the ocean or things like that. So a variety of things that really could be incorporated into the classroom, um, even some things that could be incorporated into like staff meetings and things like that. Um, and then we also linked in the early childhood calm down kit um, and then creating like a calm down corner or a calm down cove. Um, I know a lot of schools have also created like a room for staff that's very similar to what you might create for students. Um, and so just an area where staff maybe, you know, during their plan period or during lunch, or if it's like a tap in tap out situation, where they can go um, and just take a few of those minutes really kind of creating that culture of wellness, um, creating that safe cultural environment. So a few links on there, a few pictures to just kind of get you guys thinking about that as well. I mentioned the brain breaks. Um, and here we have a great resource um, on Brain Break. So it's an actual video library. So if you click on that, there's a lot of um, just kind of like free options around some different Brain Breaks, um, Peer Power, Peer PE. There's lots of different ones on this actual link. A few of them are free. Um, you can also put in, I believe, your like school email address um, and you can get a few additional resources as well. But it is just kind of a great starting point when you're thinking about how to incorporate brain breaks. Um, has some different like examples of breathing strategies and some ones that you can actually print out um, to have maybe some of those visuals for individual students to hang up in the classroom, um, things to again incorporate during like staff meetings as well. So that is just a great resource, um, has a video library full of some different examples that are free. Um, and then you can get some additional examples as well, thinking about incorporating those brain breaks. Um, UDL and SEL, so really thinking about, um, you know, all learning really is built upon social and emotional and behavioral, right? It all fits together, just like Emily was saying earlier as well. Um, so this is a great resource um, on UDL and SEL that really just outlines those five social, emotional, behavioral learning competencies, really talking about um, those checkpoints, just that relationship to UDL, and then that connection. And so this visual that we've included here, the screenshot, um, and then you can see the little arrow kind of like clicker. Uh, we wanted to do something just to kind of represent that. I think uh, Mackenzie put that in the chat as well just to kind of represent that this is a clickable link. So if you have the PDF of the slides as well, uh, you can click on that for more information. But if you do go to that site, there is a vast array of just um, some a video library. So of some different um, short video links really explaining <clears throat> UDL, SEL, that link between them. 
um, thinking about that big connection of UDL and SEL and what we do for all students and all students learn differently and things like that. Um, so there are a variety of just resources within the link that we have here on the slide. Um, Emily, did you want to mention a couple other things about this resource? Yeah, I just, when I think about UDL in, con in connection to wellness and social emotional competencies, I think she also, she refers to it in one of her videos. So it's not just my own knowledge, although we do talk about this often, that that what we're putting into place for wellness, for well-being, for self-management might not, for self-care, might not work for everyone. So like meditation for me um, is hard for me. And so offering, so if we're doing things like mindfulness in the classroom, what are some other ways that students can um, participate in that or access that. So um, maybe I need a fidget while we're doing it. So I need something to be moving. Um, I don't have, the requirement is not that I sit still to do this. Um, like deep breathing is good, but for some kids making them close their eyes or lay down and close their eyes, it can be a really big trigger for them. And so if we're doing something, can there be choices like you can have a fidget, you can lay down, you can sit in your chair, you can have your eyes closed or open. And so just offering like if we're doing things, it doesn't have to be one size fits all for everyone. That's not going to work. But how can we make sure that kids have, again, agency and a voice in how they participate in what we're putting into place or trying to offer them to work on some self-management skills? Excellent. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Um, I also think just this visual that you guys see on the screen um, right now, too, it just really does a nice job of making those connections, like when we're thinking about, you know, responsible decision making and helping students understand that, you know, just um, making those responsible decisions about their learning, about their futures, about setting goals, things like that, um, those relationship skills and how that um, affects collaboration and teamwork and working together within small groups and things like that. So this is just a nice visual that just does a nice job of making those connections um, to learning as well and could be something that could be shared with students um, as well. Um, next up, just again, a few resources, um, really thinking about uh, within, you know, building that um, community engagement, building those family relationships as well, um, really falling within, again, that number two, that recommendation number two that Emily had mentioned, designing those schools to provide settings for healthy development, um, thinking about that outreach to families. And so we did link on, um, again, you see that arrow to represent that it is, um, that picture is clickable. Um, an open house parent survey to help learn more um, about the students that are coming into your classroom, just to kind of get some information from them to help build those relationships, not only with the students, but with the families or caregivers as well. Um, a couple just good news notes or positive notes home when we're thinking about just that communication and really setting up um, that engagement with families, um, that back and forth communication as well. Um, and then we also linked in, so NDE just recently came out with a school family community engagement framework updated. And so we did link that one on there as well. Um, and then the 211 site is just a nice site with a ton of just Nebraska resources. Uh, we really like just how it's laid out. Um, it's just kind of laid out in different categories based on what you're looking for, what types of resources um, that you might be looking for throughout the state and has some contact information and links within there. So that is just a great site as well that we wanted to share with you when we're thinking about that outreach to families and making those connections and offering those, um, those resources. That brings us in to recommendation number three. So that next one, um, ensuring educator learning for developmentally supportive education. And we're just going to kind of focus on a, a couple of these pieces here, but thinking about that educator wellness piece, uh, pre-service preparation programs, in-service development. So that focus on professional development, what that looks like, um, ensuring we have follow-up uh, after that professional development as well, and then educator recruitment and uh, retention. So within that recommendation three, again, we wanted to give a few just resources around that as well. 
Um, so some ideas to, as we're thinking about promoting staff wellness, how we really continue to build that culture of staff wellness, some things that we can maybe incorporate uh, into our building as a whole, but could also be adapted, modified to be used within the classroom setting for our students as well. And so we have linked on uh, or linked in a couple things here. Um, so I wish my colleagues knew jar. I wish my teachers knew jar. So again, kind of like a staff one and then a student one, um, being able to include that, um, maybe incorporating like a shout out system, a secret buddy or a compliment jar. So we have three links on here. They have, again, just a great just array of some different ideas when we're thinking about like, how could, how could this look in my school? How could this look in my classroom? Um, so thinking about some of those pieces, we have the secret agents of kindness. Um, it is just kind of like a little lesson plan, um, how to kind of incorporate um, secret kindness agents uh, with students, kind of how to get that set up, how to have them kind of brainstorm what that might mean, how they might incorporate just different ways of um, some like ways to incorporate kindness, um, some different jobs that they could do throughout the school, um, how they might do some different just random acts of kindness throughout the week kind of writing some reflections on that, what that meant to them, um, how others responded to that. So that's just kind of a fun link um, of a way that something could be incorporated within the school. Um, the staff wellness toolkit is also a great resource. Um, there is just some additional resources, some additional links when we're thinking about really creating school employee wellness, um, how to kind of incorporate that within the building, how to create that culture um, and climate um, within there, and then supporting the whole child uh, as well. So that is just another resource that we wanted to share with you. I'm not going to click on it here, but I would encourage you just to take some time to explore each of those links if you're looking for some additional ideas of um, some ways to really target wellness, both with students as well as staff. The next one here, so this is something that we um, created, we linked in our PDF version, so Calm Down Toolkit visual. It was um, initially created just kind of for staff. Um, so as you can see here, this is just kind of the screenshot of the board that we created. So if you click on the link there, it will bring you to our PDF. Um, and thinking about just different ways to um, things that might work for us as individuals. So um, different breathing techniques, things that can remind us of those positive affirmations, um, things that we hear, things that we see, touch, smell, taste. So all of the senses, things that maybe help us to um, either bring joy or happiness or help us to calm down when we're feeling stressed, if we're feeling overwhelmed. And so if you scroll through that PDF link, we have a page of each of those senses of some different things. So for example, um, maybe for some different smells, we have um, just a visual on there for like oils, lotion, candle, rain, um, the outdoors, peppermint, eucalyptus, lavender. So we try to just come up with a variety of different things. What we've done when we've shared this um, with staff is encourage them to print it off, um, laminate it, cut it out in little squares, and then they can build their own board. So the screenshot that you see on the slides right now, that is the board that they would build, um, you know, choosing one of the visuals or maybe making a different visual of their own that maybe we didn't capture um, within the PDF link. Um, but just as a reminder that you could post it for students, maybe it's in their locker, for staff, maybe it's on their desk or hanging up in their classroom by their computer, whatever it might be, as a reminder of some things that they have in their toolbox um, to help them when we're, they're feeling stressed or when they're feeling overwhelmed. Um, so just another idea there, um, something that you could share or help staff or make a student version um, to, to help with just kind of that wellness piece as well. Um, this is another link. So we did include, again, just some of the screenshots there, but 
Thriving University um, is a great link, has a ton of resources. So clicked on it here. So if you scroll down, there's some free resources, um, some like self-care bingo links. There are some goal setting. Um, let's see, there are some, the calming glitter jar. So an idea for that, some different optimistic closure. Um, so a variety of different links just within that link that we wanted to share with you as well. So some things to check out um, as you're planning for this upcoming school year. Um, this, so again, we linked in a webinar um, that has more information, but really thinking about creating those habits of wellness and how we develop those positive habits um, for wellness, because it does take time, it does take energy to um, to really identify those. And so this is just kind of a nice visual. It comes from the webinar. Um, and we, like I said, we've linked in the webinar here as well. But thinking about um, what are some of those things that bring us joy, that bring us happiness? What are some of those bucket fillers? So maybe it's working out um, that is a bucket filler for you, just kind of accomplishing, um, being able to get to the gym or working out at home or going for a walk, whatever it might be. And then thinking about what is it that will help to increase the likelihood of engaging in those behaviors. So engaging in those bucket fillers, those things that bring us joy, those things that bring us happiness. So maybe if it's working out, it's identifying a friend or a buddy, um, just an accountability partner to be able to go on those walks or be able to go to the gym together, um, you know, texting each other, giving each other a call, having those alarms set, whatever it might be um, that would help to increase that likelihood. And then what will you do to increase the likelihood of repeating those behaviors? So thinking about um, how that makes you feel after you complete that workout, you know, accomplishing that goal, feeling more energized, being able to have more focus. Um, and so just kind of a nice way to think about that and a nice way to think about how we really build those habits of wellness into our everyday routines. Um, next, kind of on when we're thinking about those recommendations, thinking about that professional development, um, I had mentioned as well. So thinking about that beyond one and done, right? What are we doing to help support um, and continuing to have those check-ins um, on professional development? Thinking about a variety of different topics to help support our staff. Um, you know, it's obviously very important to have that professional development on curriculum, but also thinking about restorative practices, thinking about trauma-informed care, thinking about mental health literacy. Um, and we have linked in as we're thinking about that professional development, just um, some different resources kind of around some of those topics as well. But how do we make it more than um, just kind of that one and done? How are we having that follow-up? How are we continuing to have those conversations, that collaboration around whatever that professional development topic was? Um, how are we identifying those goals and those priority area areas and then um, taking steps to continue to accomplish that from there? Um, this, so the six causes of burnout, um, again, so we have the resource at the bottom there, but really thinking about um, this comes from the Harvard uh, Business Review. And so while it was really created to think about like workplace burnout, I think we just really need that reminder that it can apply to students as well, students within the classroom, thinking about burnout within the classroom too, um, and thinking about the setup of not only the environment for staff, but also the environment for students. Um, when we think about those six causes of burnout, so we have that workload, uh, that perceived lack of control, that lack of reward or recognition, um, poor relationships, lack of fairness, and values mismatch. So again, thinking about it from both the adult as well as the student perspective. So is the workload manageable um, for both students as well as staff? Are we considering that voice and choice, again, for students as well as staff? Are we... Um, taking into account recognition within the classroom, within the school, um, understanding the value of learning um, and investing in the environment for both peers and adults. So just kind of a nice way to, to think about that six causes of burnout um, as well. So 
And continuing on with that, so this is just a nice uh, reminder quote. So thinking about self-empathy, self-empathy is empathy too. Treat yourself with kindness the same way that you would treat a friend who is having a hard time. So a lot of times, um, you know, it we need that reminder that it really starts with us. We need to show ourselves that same compassion and self self-compassion as we do for others, um, thinking about how we might respond to a friend or to a family member when they're having a hard time and thinking about how we can do that same thing for ourselves, right? We all um, encounter disappointment. We all make mistakes, but thinking about the way that we talk to ourselves when those things happen um, and giving ourselves grace as well. Um, and talking to ourselves just more in that positive matter. And so if you click on that self-compassion exercises, it again, has a variety of different just links and resources when we're thinking about self-compassion, incorporating self-compassion and teaching about self-compassion and the importance of it um, as well. And with that, we also wanted to put together, so you know that we start um, each of our just presentations, our um, time together with those welcoming inclusion activities. We always like to close with those optimistic closure activities. So we wanted to put together um, just a few ready-made ones for you guys. So we did... Um, we have a few of the welcoming inclusion, a few of the optimistic closure that you guys can take and use either in your classroom um, or could use for staff meetings or things like that um, within your school building as well. Um, really centered around wellness, some things to get you thinking about that. And so we wanted to offer that to you guys as a resource. So you can certainly click on that and feel free um, to share with colleagues as well. I know summer is coming to an end. It's already not even sure how it's the almost the end of July, but still thinking about we still have some time, right? So if you're looking for some additional just resources around wellness, um, looking maybe to add a few books to your summer reading list as we close summer out, um, a few just kind of recommendations that either recommendations that have been given to us or ones that we have ourselves read and really enjoyed. So we did link each of those three on there. So if you click on them, it would just take you to, I think it's just the Amazon link to give you a little more information about those book resources. Uh, we also linked in self-care for educators, a podcast and resources uh, there as well. I know uh, we've shared this before, but this is just another great resource for teams as well. Um, this are, is the evidence-based strategy series from our regional leads. They did a great job putting that together. Um, so those are all linked on there as well. Um, they will also give you a little more information if you click on them um, around just kind of what's included within that webinar. And then that brings us to our exit ticket, um, which Emily, I believe, just dropped in the chat as well. So our next Coffee Connect, like we mentioned, is on August 16th around SEBL integrated discussion, um, integrated instruction rather than discussion, uh, but we will discuss it. Um, so you guys can feel free to fill out that exit ticket there. Again, just gives us more information as we plan for our fall Coffee Connects. Um, you can also get a certificate of attendance through that link as well. And then that brings us to our optimistic closure. I know we are already two minutes over, so I completely understand if you need to sneak out, but we just wanted to give you guys an opportunity to share any resources, kind of like your go-tos um, around wellness for staff or for students. Um, you can certainly drop them in the chat. We can add them to the Padlet uh, from there. You can also add them to the Padlet yourself if you would like to, um, or if you're able to stay and want to share with the, the rest of us that are on here um, about a tool or resource that's just kind of your go-to around wellness, we'd love to hear from you. Um, something else or anything else comes up that you would like to share, you can certainly add it to the Padlet. You can email any one of us and we can certainly add it to the Padlet as well. Um, but hopefully you guys were able to take away some different resources as we're thinking about really creating that classroom environment for well-being for both students as well as staff. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, have a great rest of your July and we will see you in August. Thank you all. Good to see you.
all of you, any MTSS and others. <laughs> Thanks for always joining and being on. <laughs>